So we are now broadcasting from my lips. Right, good. I can't, I can't see the, uh, I can see we've got a number of uh, attendees joining us now, gentlemen. So uh, here we go, week 11. I can't believe it's gone so fast. Can you, Keith? Well, I think uh, what happens is uh, it's normal, eh? You know, weeks do go fast, and as we get older, the weeks seem to go faster and faster. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're pulling... The young guy will be, you know, he's he spent double the time this week than we have, hasn't he, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> we've got, we've got, we're, we're picking up friends as we go along. We've got, we've got uh, John and, and Tony here now, whereas when we started off, we were on our own, weren't we? That's correct, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. So and and Buddy, of course, was. Uh, we haven't seen Buddy yet. I think we need to see Buddy. Well, he's a little <laughs> bashful because he always wants to join in. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Except the postman comes. So. Right. Good. So, uh, John, how's your week been? Yeah, good. Good. Not a lot of DIY. A lot of home stuff, hanging doors and. <laughs> building walls and stuff but had termite damage <laughs> termite damage have you had any mm. termite damage tony no 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 nothing like that that's yeah. yeah, been a pretty uh, pretty fine week in the uk so uh from the uh from the very very hot almost uh mediterranean i think we had some weather front from libya was it libya came over on the uh, last friday we had record temperatures on Friday, high thirties. Uh, so, um, but uh, now we're back to back to normal. You're pleased to know it's overcast and windy, but not raining. So, uh, no complaints. Right now, we've got uh, so another five five minutes to go. So, um, um, yeah, we've had uh, we've gone through a number of topics here. I think uh, one of the things. Uh, uh, Keith, when we start off, you'll be uh, just reminding everyone that, you know, whilst we aim to educate and inform, it, uh, it doesn't make anybody, uh, you know, you need, to, you need to come on a full training course to, uh, and uh, do the uh, qualifications necessary to be able to um, exercise your newfound skills. Uh, but until then, leave it to the professionals. Isn't that right, Keith? Well, I, I think what it what it is, uh, um, you know, that there is various levels of of, uh, of, of education and learning uh, associated with um, airfield ground lighting. I mean, we most people involved in airfield light, uh, airfield ground lighting, are actually an engineering have an engineering qualification at some level, and in generally speaking, we are we come from the electrical engineering. And in the electrical engineering world, then our academic training and our engineering training associated with that has always been involved, associated with constant voltage systems, building technology, basically. Yet we have a qualification in this electrical world, yet when we go airside and we go into airfield ground lighting, then suddenly this uh, constant current emerges and the traditional systems that have emerged over the last uh, 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 since we've had lighting uh, has been associated with constant current and there are some fundamental differences and it's those fundamental differences that we have to educate ourselves about because if we fail to adhere to certain safety uh, processes and parameters uh, you know, associated with constant current is that we could get seriously injured or killed. And there has been deaths on an airfield associated uh, um, uh, with electrocution from AGL, from airfield ground lighting. And it's that educational side which is really important. But then we take it to another level and whereby not just do we, we educate ourselves, and we have, the, we have that knowledge. And then the next step is, well, how do we 
execute that knowledge, they'll implement that knowledge out in the field in reality. So we have to gain the skills. So there's different levels of training associated with becoming a competent person to be able to work on AGL. And, and it's those levels of, of, of learning uh, that we need to go through, like in, in the form of a basic training, uh, so which everybody needs to have an understanding. And then we go on to qualification training associated with our job function. And, uh, and then thereafter, we need to develop, uh, have to continuation training uh, that, uh, for example, uh, technology changes. Things, uh, uh, we've moved, for example, from function halogen to, to LEDs. And uh, there's, there's a, a step where LEDs perform differently to tungsten halogen. So we have to, to have that kind of change uh, and, and that knowledge associated with the different technologies. CCRs, the constant current regulators in a standard system. That's migrated uh, from, uh, you know, big uh, uh, transformer-based units many, many, many years ago to the use of uh, uh, silicon control rectifiers, commonly called thyristors. And that's been the norm for many, many years. But now we're moving into transistor-based, which are called IGBT transistor-based or even high-frequency uh, regulators. So the, you know, and, and the technology is moving on again and quite qu quickly. So we need to have this continuation training. And then if you do, uh, you know, you may be a lecturer, you're working in the field, and then a position comes available to be the shift supervisor, for example. Now that is then development. So you have to have some uh, 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 additional uh, education associated with being a supervisory or being a manager associated with AGL. So these are the progressive levels of, of training is very, very important. Uh, you know, so that, that, that's, so while you talk about training, uh, Robert, it's, uh, it's not just, oh, I've had some training. So when did you, oh, I, I attended a course 20 years ago, as we do here. And, you know, so there's yeah. it's a mixture of classroom training, uh, skills training, on the job training, there's a, a it's a progression. Yeah, and no matter what formal training you've got, uh, Keith, uh, there's a process of continual pro professional development, which uh, is necessary because of the, the demands of the, the fast changing demands of the environment that we're operating in. And I guess, uh, Tony, you have, you have seen, a, you have done a bit of continual professional de development over your, over your years in the industry. You could, you could say that, but I just think uh, the development of visual aids, when I started, the only way you could test them for real was to, was to build a prototype and put it in an airport and do some flying um, against it, um, which was all very speculative in the sense of, well, what if that one doesn't work? Have you actually got funding to make another one? And uh, the tendency was if, if the first one works, you don't look for an optimum, that one's good enough. And uh, so we'll take that company's drawings and make them the international standard. That's what happened, um, you know, 50 years ago. Now you can research with, with the aid of, of the simulation now, where you can have very real, realistic visuals. You can do a lot of proofing of concepts before you ever cut metal, as it were, and your, your flight tests are really uh, at, towards the end of, of the research program and they're not at right at the front end. I know we're doing the Q&A at the end, but it's just coming up to two o'clock. One, one final question before we start. To what extent has, have the limitation, have limit constraints in technology limited the standards that we're now operating to in a, in, a, in, a, in a technological age that has potentially outstripped those limitations? No, who do you want to answer that? Um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like buying a laptop, eh? Uh, I remember when I, when I first got my first laptop and, uh, and then I thought I'll need a new one. So I went along to search for a, a new laptop and there in the window of the, uh, uh, one of the big uh, national companies who provide 
uh, laptop. Uh, the latest, the latest latest. And I thought, yes, and I went in and I bought it. I got home, loaded all the software that I needed associated with it, and blow me on the television. It was a replacement already. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, so I went back and kicked off in this shop about these people to them. And uh, then, of course, I'd already bought it. It was just too late, you know? And, uh, and, and that's the issue with technology. The technology of today is advancing at such a speed, then standards cannot keep up. And, 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 and I think that's something which uh, 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 Tony has a, a you know, it's a, really feathering your cap in many ways, Tony, that um, you, you certainly have to uh, relook at standards, revisit standards. Good. Well, yeah, thank, thank you, Kate. Uh, it, it may be an increasing problem. You know, I'm talking about a review after 40 years. It may be that you need to do an annual review if, if the, the pace of development continues as it is. Right, well, look, it's two o'clock, just gone two o'clock now. So I'd like to officially start this week's, uh, this week's uh, present presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, Keith, if you'd like to grab the, uh, grab, the presentation for, grab the presentation for today and put up your slides. Uh, but Keith will introduce today. So Keith, no, Keith Costell, Director of TMS Training Solutions and uh, a world-renowned training expert, uh, uh, in the field of airfield lighting and ground traffic management. Um, this week, the subject is uh, uh, AGL design methodology where uh, John Laheef has kindly agreed to uh, uh, provide week two of, of his uh, des designer training. Um, as, as you know, he's a, uh, as a, as a designer in his own right, has his own company and uh, 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 details are available on our website if you want to contact him for any work directly. And so Keith will introduce today and then, and then uh, John will conclude his presentation. And then we've allowed a half an hour to answer your numerous questions that you've been feeding into us and which we've organized by topic um, to try and make it easier to comprehend. So first of all, if I could introduce Keith, thank you very much. Uh, Robert, can you see my slides? I can. Right. Yes. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening, uh, depending on where we are in the world. Eh? So, so welcome again to our webinar 11. And uh, uh, webinar 11, it's the, as Robert has explained, it's the second week of our, uh, of our uh, design methodology. And there's quite a few things that we need to clarify uh, and discuss. But I want to give you an update to the, to the COVID uh, 19 operations and for information I've just left an IKO webinar associated with runway safety and just for your information that the the IKO released their document 9981 which is the PANS aerodrome uh, aerodromes third edition and there's a, a, a chapter on runway safety and from an AGL and airfield ground lighting viewpoint they refer to Annex 14, and very interestingly, and I'll read it, so I've got it, I've just written it down, right? and it says that the, the standards, there's going to be discussions on the visual aids for day and night and all weather operations. There's going to be discussions on surface management, including runway incursions, and the visual aids construction standards. Very interesting. So this is just a few little bullet points I just read, put down very quickly, literally in the last 20 minutes from IKO. So here is on this slide, I'd just like to go to uh, something which IKO have already issued. And there is uh, an, an issue of guidance for aerodrome and ground aids, both to regulators and to aerodromes globally. And uh, it's all the, the the three subjects are for aerodromes is aerodrome certification, the coordination of, uh, of the, the, the closure and the reduced capacity. And of course, the third element is resuming air aerodrome operations where we're in this phase. And the key subjects is, is under 
into these five in its alphabetical A, B, C, D, D and E. A is on aerodrome infrastructure, B is on aerodrome operations, C is on certification and compliance, D, coordination and collaboration, and E on human resources, competency and training of personnel. But moving on to exactly what it actually means, uh, I've extracted, they've issued a sample checklist for aerodrome for the operations. And interestingly, the A, B, C, D, E concept, I've extracted just the ones which are relevant to airfield ground lighting. Resuming airside works, including but not limited to the review of a work plan under the changed conditions such as contractual obligations, additional safety precautions, etc. Then there's D1, which is the stakeholders' preparedness, and, uh, and that refers to the airport collaborative decision making, which John will refer to a little later this afternoon, and uh, or today, and also aerodrome personnel, and, and associated with training uh, of air, uh, airfield personnel about their roles and responsibilities, and the undertaking of refresher training for those that uh, uh, have what, what lapsed permits, etc. So really, really interesting uh, uh, scenario. But jumping backwards to the A and the B part, uh, there's for the uh, infrastructure, there's visual aids for navigation. There is electrical systems. Now, if you see here, look, visual aids for navigation, including, but not limited to markings, lights, including PAPI signs and status of OBS lights, which of course we've been talking about over these last uh, few weeks, including the electrical side, which is the primary and the secondary power. And the management on the apron, because let's not forget, it's runway and taxiway and apron where we have airfield ground lighting. And apron front lighting is one element. So just to, to uh, give you an understanding, this is issued as a checklist by IKO to the industry. And this is really hot off the press. So going on to this week, and I would like to clarify, John is going to talk a little bit in a few minutes, literally in a few minutes, and, and continue with our design methodology. And uh, what I want to uh, uh, explain, we discussed a few things in webinar 10 last week. Uh, what we're going to discuss this week is uh, a, a brief, a, a short briefing on the design methods and calculation tools again, but equipment selection, and then the moving on to the uh, surface movement guidance, SMEGS, as some people call it, the follow the green, the individual light control and monitoring, design considerations, and then we'll have the Q&A session, which uh, Robert referred to. Uh, but I wanted to bring this slide again from last week, because it's the methodology that we're talking about, the design methodology, and the concept of how we evolve the design from nothing, basically, to 100% design. And these are some generic, and it's highlighted looking in, in yellow here on this slide. 30%, 60%, 90%, and 100%. At different levels associated with when we're looking at a, a project. And these are very generic percentages, by the way. So don't turn around and say, oh, Keith said, I've got to have 60% of the design in, in, in the tender space. It's not like that. It's very, very generic and it gives you an understanding how we evolve the methodology. Uh, then just to recap from John of last week, associated with the design criteria and all the elements that we have to consider in the design criteria from the spacings and the tolerances associated with the lights through to the, the actual tools that, that such as John uses. So um, one of such things is, uh, uh, which I think is a, a, absolutely a superb slide. Uh, John has extracted all this information from the isocandela diagrams. So, and, and interestingly, if there's going to be towing, for example, uh, of, of a light, in accordance with this little diagram of John's, 
then here, then it's going to be in the notes. So the isocandela diagram in Annex 14, Volume 1, currently at Edition 8, then in the isocandela diagrams, then there is a set of notes underneath the diagram. If there is towing, it will always be in the notes, not on the diagram. Let's be certain about that. Uh, then going on to the, um, um, uh, method the overall methodology, and we spoke about pappies. And, and there's been some one or two questions about pappies in the, in the last week, and we'll, we'll discuss it afterwards. But the key issue is that we have been asked if we would share our methodology and the way we uh, uh, calculate the pappies with and without an ILS, and the answer is, sorry guys, no. The PAPI is probably the key AGL equipment that has a direct influence on flight safety during the approach and the final landing, the most critical parts of flight. No way are we gonna share our methodology. It must, those calculations must be done by someone who knows what they are doing. And John last week shared, he always re revises it before he even does it, every single occasion. And, and, and therefore, sorry guys, we don't share our design methodology for PAPI calculations. Um, another comment came up on, on the calculation of primary uh, 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 loads and the calculation of selecting the size of CCRs. Now this again is a is a is a huge subject. We cannot possibly cover it in a webinar. And there's been comments of, oh, those figures are not quite correct. Uh, uh, we use different numbers. Well, actually, what we've done is taken what is in the Aerodrome Design Manual Part Five, and that is the reference that you go to. Now, dependent upon the cable and the cable manufacturer, they may have different amount of, of material in their copper cable. So the resistivity element is very generic. You have to ask the cable manufacturer exactly what is in their particular uh, um, uh, cable, con the uh, current carrying conductor, uh, etc. And very generically, we tend to use around three ohms, and in fact, for, a, for an AGL uh, cable, type C, and there are various types, type A, type B, type C, and fly C, and, uh, and there are different consistencies. Uh, it's six millimeter current carrying, six millimeter squared for primary cable, uh, uh, current carrying conductor, it has a nominal 3.11 ohms per kilometer. But I've also put here, look, something from RS Components, an international part of the Electro Component International Company, and they, they give us some little guidelines. It's really, really good. 19 divided by the 2.5 millimeter square, or 19 by four, 19 by six, and it gives you a figure per kilometer. And it's not far out. It's actually quite good. So if you're doing a mental calculation, use those figures. But when we do detailed design, we do a detailed, real detailed uh, calculation. That's uh, the message that we're putting across. Methodology, detailed for the design. You want general information? That's fine. The other, so when it comes to the calculation, uh, basically, we calculate the primary circuit, uh, and uh, uh, or shall I start the other way around? We start with the secondary circuit, one secondary circuit, one secondary circuit, inclusive of the light, inclusive of the uh, remote switches for ILCMS or uh, cable, uh, secondary cable losses, the efficiency of the transformer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we work out the losses in kilowatts or watts associated with one secondary circuit. Then we multiply by the number of secondary circuits and then we add the primary circuit to it. And if we're going to select a CCR, then what we do is 
then we add a contingency in. We, number one is we add a contingency for the efficiency of a CCR. And the worst case CCR in accordance with standards, it shall be efficient to 90%. And therefore, if I've got a, a, a circuit uh, of something like 14 kilowatts after I've connected, uh, uh, calculated, then 14 kilowatts, can I put a 15 kVA CCR on that circuit? Well, if I take 10% away from 15, then the answer is no. So I'd have to go to a 10, 20 kVA. So a 20 kVA for a 14 kilowatt circuit. And, and, and so we take away 10% for efficiency, but we add another 10% uh, on that calculation for contingency. But once again, we do that in great detail when we calculate in a final design. We also went to uh, uh, discuss about interleaving, and this is where I'm going to bring John in. So John is going to they're like go on from there. I, I this here I, I we talked about interleaving. Interleaving uh, all runway related lights shall be interleaved. Shall be when it comes to taxiway related lights or lights or systems associated with aircraft safety and or and or uh, for surface movement guidance then those lights in systems will be interleaved. But the other taxiway related lights are not interleaved. John will go on to that. So John, can I hand over to you here now? Yes, thanks Keith. Thanks for the recap and the intro. Okay. Stop share. Okay, I'm sharing the wrong screen, am I? Okay, one sec. No, you're fine. You're fine there. Was that the, which screen did you see? The, the... Interleaving screen, yes. Okay. No, but did you see the, uh, let me, let me see. Yeah, yeah, the screen's right. Joys of the yeah. joys of live broadcasting. That's right, John. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was showing you the uh, the presenter's screen as opposed to the large screen. Or right, let me just put on my stopwatch here. I'll try and do it thirty minutes. Okay. So um, yeah. So last week we didn't because uh, you know I prepared fifty something slides. So it was it was rather ambitious to try and get through everything in. Um, in, in, within the time. So we, we stopped just at the interleaving point. So just uh, where Keith handed over there, you can see I've my slide, I think I added it one or just another picture, it's just slightly different. But um, so for every uh, approach and runway systems, we should be interleaved across at least two circuits. And then when, when we consider taxiway systems, when, when, we, when we have essential category two, three systems, then we should be interleaving also. So I'll just take a look at a few gen a few systems here, and then um, uh, and then the next slide I'll take a look at uh, uh, run my center line, how to maintain color coding and things like that. So the first one is you'll see up the top we looked at um, the approach lights. Uh, we we did a little bit on the approach lights last week. I just showed the two different types, and then I did the approach profile calculation. So based on whether you have a type A or a type B, type A is your, um, is your distance code and calvert, or type B is your barrette. This will be interleaved across two circuits. So you can see at the top of the slide, let me get my mouse. So you can either do the interleaving by uh, longitudinally, or you can go across the different rows. You can do it laterally. This is, the, this is the more common type. The difference between the two, if you lose a circuit here, you're going to go from 30 to 60 meter spacings. If you lose a circuit here, you'll still maintain, you'll still have a light every 30 meters. And then the, this is just the interleaving for the caliber type. Now for, these are the category one patterns. So you'll have two circuits across the category one. When you come into the category two, three pattern, you need an, an additional two circuits. So in here, I've colored them in this uh, magenta and orange you'll see the, di the different uh, 
interleaving that's used for the inner 300 meters. Um, uh, Pappies, we spoke about last week. We spoke about the calculation, but one of the, this was a question I think came up uh, a few webinars back as well. How do you interleave a pappy? So if you have if you have a single pappy on the here it's shown on the left hand side, or maybe it's on the right hand side. So typically we'll interleave across two circuits. So you'll interleave across the lamps. Now if if now you have an LED pappy, you'll have to check with your manufacturer how how you achieve this because um, different LED, it's not like where traditional pappies with halogen, you'll have a number of projectors, you might have two lamps, three lamps, and it's easy to go across. So with LED, you have to go back and check with your manufacturer. In the, if we have the case of here, which, which you'll see is quite common now, hub airports, we have a pappy on both sides, on the left and the right. What we'll do is we'll use one circuit entirely on one side and one circuit entirely on the other side. So I just, I spoke a bit about the next slide is uh, run my interleaving. So I all, we, uh, sorry, run my center line interleaving, maintaining the color coding. So we also come across this with our um, exit taxiways, with our alternate green, yellow lighting. So if, if we interleave these circuits, uh, we, we have to interleave these circuits. When they're interleaved, if we just do every alternate fixture, if we lose, if we lose a circuit, then you're going to lose all of either all of your greens or all of your yellows on for a pilot exiting a taxiway. So here we have to we have to interleave in pairs across. So you can see I have pairs across here. It's done in pairs. It's done in pairs. And then once I get past my uh, my critical uh, ILS zone here, then then it can go into just standard alternate interleaving. Some airports do this differently. Some airports do, they have, they, they'll have pair, they'll have double yellows, double greens, double yellows, double greens. Some have more than two circuits. Um, so it's just an example of how it's shown. Um, just here is just the threshold. So with the threshold, um, for your, your, when you're, when your threshold should be on two dedicated circuits. And so here you'll have your two dedicated uh, circuits for your threshold. And then for your runway, then your runway end lights, they'll be on your runway edge circuits. So they're just some generic examples. Okay. Um, so here I'll just show, here's interleaving for a runway center line circuit. So here we have, you'll notice, so with the final, um, when we get to the final 900 meters, uh, please, it's not the scale, forgive me. So the final 900 meters down to the 300 meters, we have this alternate red, white. So this is, an, this is pointing in, coming in, an aircraft coming in this direction. You'll have alternates, red, white, red, white. When you get to the final 300 meters, you'll have all reds. And it's, it's the same on the opposite side. So when we're in the middle where it's all whites, you're interleaving, we can go across alternate. So one, one, uh, alternate fixtures, alternate circuits. But when we get to the uh, final, when we get to this um, 900 to 300 meters, like the like example I showed on the green yellows, we'll, you, you'll have to go in pairs. Otherwise, if you lost the circuit, you're gonna lose all your reds or you're gonna lose all your whites. And you can imagine if you lost all your reds, then the pilot would not know he was at the final, in the final 900 meters until he, hit the, until he hit the reds down the end and then it could be too late. And then when we get to the final reds, then you can alternate again. Um, this example will, uh, this will preserve the color coding. But there's also, if you want to preserve the color coding and the even spacing, so you want, you don't want to drop out spacing, uh, then, then you'd have to use it across three circuits. Okay. And then I'll just take a look at systems that are not interleaved. Or typically not interleaved. So signs are typically not interleaved, um, but they can be. Sometimes signs are on, they're on taxiway edge circuits, they're on their own circuits. But if you do have interleaved interleave sign circuits, then where you have a holding position, you have your, you know, alpha uh, 0119 category one and the same on the opposite, they, 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 these two signs should be on different circuits. So if you do lose if you do lose one of the circuits, you'll still have that uh, information at the uh, holding position. 
So retails or uh, rapid exit taxiway indicator lights are not interleaved. And they, they should be, served, they should be um, fed from a dedicated circuit or block controllable. So if one fixture fails, then all of the lights should be extinguished. So these are your lights. So here, if one of these lights was to fail, you don't want to give the misinformation. Because if one is gone, the pilot might think, oh, I only have, I only have 100 meters left. Because this is 300 meters from the point of tangency, 200 meters, 100 meters, there's, there, there you go. So you can achieve this by, well, I say block controllable. If you have an ILCMS, then you can, you can have it set up in the ILCMS. So if one fixture fails, they all drop out. If you are doing it in halogen, um, you, can put, you can wire all the circuits in series. You can have a cutout film inside the lights. So if one light uh, goes, it breaks, it breaks the chain of all the lights. And then they could be fed from one 500 watt transformer. Um, so runway, runway guard lights as well, they're not required by in the Aerodrome Design Manual Part 5 to be interleaved, though it says it is good practice. I would recommend to interleave them. And the same again as the, um, what we had with the signs. So if you take the configuration A, which is the elevated uh, runway guard lights or wigwags, if we do interleave, you'll have circuit one, circuit two. If we have the configuration B, which is the inset, the inset lights, you'll have to do it in pairs because when it, it, it doesn't, um, they, the, the lights kind of, it goes like that when you see it, when it wigwags, it, it goes across like this. So you'll have to go in pairs. Um, and then finally, taxiway edge lights are not required to be interleaved. Some airports, they do interleave them, but it's, it's not required. So here, um, a lot of people always ask, where do I actually put my sign? So here's a diagram I made up, not, not, again, not the scale, so please forgive me. So it just shows typical, um, uh, typical signs and typical distances you're, they're allowed for installation. So if you see here, so I'll start again at my holding position. So here's my, this is my uh, category one holding position marking. So the, between the sign and the edge of the taxiway marking, I'm allowed to install these signs 11 to 21 meters away. Now, if you have an airport with uh, large bodied aircrafts, long, large wingspans or uh, props, it's recommended to, to, to take the maximum distance, install them out at the 21 meters. So you'll see, um, if I take another one example, a runway exit sign here. So the runway exit sign, because this is to be eight to 15 meters off the edge. So again, take the 15. So where does this actually go? It has to be at least 60 meters before the point of tangency. So the point of tangency is where an aircraft comes across here and the point where he starts to make his turn. So this, this is showing it here. So you can see that for um, runways, we have this eight to 15 meters. For taxiways, we have 11 to 21 meters. So I just, I just show, like in webinar two, Keith did go through all the signs. So he went through what were mandatory signs, what were information signs. I'll just say with the signs, um, you know, if we take a lot, like our code three, code four airport. So an, an, an information sign will have a character height of 300 millimeters. So the, the height of our, our actual sign height is 600, 650, 700, something like that, the box. And then for our mandatory signs, they're 400 character height. So you have an 800, 900 box. But just to be aware that even runway exit signs, even though it's a yellow, it's not a red for a mandatory sign, that does have the larger character height. And so do runway vacated signs. Now runway vacated signs, if you have your green, yellow lights, they're not required. So you don't, you don't tend to see these too much. Everywhere where you will have your green, yellow exit lights, your yellow will give, your yellow, your yellow located to the, uh, the final um, holding position will tell, will tell the pilot that he's, he's already exited the ILS critical area. So it's not required. Um, here as well, these are just some military signs I've shown as well. These are distance to go markers. So what they're, 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 they're just in this direction, that's a nine. So it's, it's telling you that there's uh, 9,000 feet to go. It'll go 9876. And here you can see there's 1,000 feet to go. So it's typically 1,000 feet or 300 meters between each sign. And then the sign closest to the ends will be 1,250 feet or 
381 meters. It's it's um, it's you only you only really come across it in military airports. So um, I have now some slides on. Uh, I'll talk about equipment selection. Then we talk a bit about uh, ace megs. Uh, a little bit on follow the greens and then considerations for follow the greens with ILCMS. So this is just a generic slide on if what AGL, how to select it, or what considerations to have when you're selecting the AGL equipment would be the easiest way. So with, with your CCR, or you may have another another power supply, you may be using another low um, a low current system. There are other two amp systems out there that aren't used by a CCR. But if you're using a CCR, uh, what um, what type? You know, I, Keith spoke about this a little earlier when uh, Robert asked the question about the movement in technology. He kind of listed these. So is it a thyristor type? There's uh, high frequency types and uh, IGBT or sine wave. IGBT is insulated gate bipolar transistor. Um, when we're selecting primary cable, are you using screened cable or unscreened cable? Are you, what type, okay, is it a type B, a type C? The type B or the type C is, is based on the insulation. Um, is it a XLP cross-linked polyethylene or a, a PE um, sheet? Um, obviously, it, for me, screen, the screen is far better um, than non-screen. But some countries use non-screen. It's, it's the standard in a lot of countries to use non-screen. Um, if we're selecting primary connectors, what, what connector to use? Are you using a resin connector? Are you using a, uh, like uh, silicone connectors? Um, is it there's like dry snap-on connectors now? Are you cutting off the connectors doing a splice? For me, the best one is the resin connector. Um, when you're selecting your transformers then, so different brands, there's also, um, I'll talk about this a little, it's, a, it's more important with the ILCMS. Um, like there's, there's transformers and then there's low induction transformers. And then when we're selecting our transformers, we have to rate these transformers. So we have to ensure we have the correct transformer rating for the correct, for the correct light. So, the, and the pet also the, um, how long is our secondary? So you may have a light with a very, um, with a very low, very low wattage. You know, it could be a, a unidirectional intermediate holding position or something. It could be in the it could be right before a very complex junction, and the actual um, the transformer could be a hundred meters away. So you, you have to consider your transformer size for that, and, and possibly your your, uh, your secondary cable size as well. So with secondary cable and connectors, um, I mean the cross section of your secondary cable. Um, so what type of cable? You know, some airports they'll use for elevated lights or lights in a duct, they'll use a two core cable. Where they have a saw cut, they'll always, they'll use single core cables. Um, some airports will just use a two core cable everywhere. You know, what connectors are you using? Are you cutting the ends off and just, just doing the field connectors? Or some, air, some airports where, in countries where they have a lot of, um, a lot of rain where it's very damp, They'll, use, they'll buy the transformer leads. So you'll buy a lead one meter long with a factory molded plug. You'll, uh, you'll uh, do a straight through crimp onto the secondary cable. You'll heat shrink over it and then, you, then you'll have a watertight uh, secondary connection. Um, your transformer housing and arrangement. So, you know, your, maybe your transformer housing is inside your deep base. Maybe it's a deep base with your light on top. Maybe it's a deep base off to the side with a blank cover, and that's what you're using for your transformer. Maybe you're using a handhold that's only 450, 600 uh, square, and it's only less than half a meter deep. Maybe in, in some, some, um, some manholes, you'll, you'll see that they're like, you get down a ladder and you get inside them. They're like bathrooms, you know, they're like small hotel bathrooms. They're like two and a half meters high, and you, you know, it's, it's quite a large area. So then how, um, how are you going to lay out your transformers? So how many trays do you need? You know, you'll, you'll have, uh, if you have like ILCMS, typically you have one tray with your transformers, your primary connections, another tray with your ILCMS units, then your secondary connections will be on top. Maybe you only have two trays. Um, if it's a handhole, maybe, you know, you don't have that room. So you may have a bracket where the transformers are just slotted in, you lift them out. 
Maybe you just want uh, angle bar. You just want to hold the transformers. So it depends on your airport. You've got to look at your arrangements and how um, what's inside there. Uh, your air bar. Your, does each manhole have an air to electrode? So this leads into air to encounter points. Now, like air to encounter points, you could do, this is not an offer, Robert. You could do webinars on this. Because there's, there's different, depending regionally and different, you could have a, a counterpoint, an independent counterpoint system, which is uh, like a, a lightning protection system or an independent earthing system. If you combine the two, it, it can also be called a counterpoint system. So what, what do you, is everything at the same potential? Do you have a rod every 300, 150 meters? Do you have a rod in every manhole? You know, do, are you, are you uh, linking um, uh, like a 25 square, 16 square amongst the earth bars. So there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole different ways of doing it. Um, what fixtures are you going to select? Is it LED or halogen? So depending on, you know, all new, air, new, new installations, you're not going to use halogen pretty much anymore. It's, it's, it's only where you have existing installations that, that, it, that it's being used. Um, Identifying the, the fixture type for correct ordering. So here, this little diagram, um, something like you've got to see, you've got to ensure when you, when you order the light, you order the correct light. So here I've given an example of a light. So it, this is a green, yellow curved light. So if you stand on the light, there, there should be an arrow on the, on the fixture pointing towards the center of the radius of the curve. So if you stand on the light, you look towards the center of the curve, your left foot will be on the green, your right foot will be on the yellow. So whatever your left foot falls, that's the first. That'll, just, that'll determine what the first color is. So this is the green-yellow curve. Because you can't put a yellow-green curve in there, you get mixed up. It, it, the arrow will be facing the wrong way. So this care has to be, has to be taken. And same for, I don't know if on the towing chart, I, I did show um, the, some of the color coding as well. When you water run my edge lights, you gotta be, is it a white yellow? Is it a yellow white? So the, the fixtures up here and this uh, tend to be the same, are the same as these and the fixtures here are the same as these. So you just need to be aware of it and, and uh, uh, the different types. Um, uh, compatibility between the different systems. Um, intensity ratios, uh, Tony Smith talked about this. So there are intensity ratios set up by ICAO. So after the appendix two, um, it lists the different intensity ratios. So it, there's no, um, you might think, he gave an example, you might think you're getting a, a fantastic light with this great three times the uh, intensity, but if it doesn't fit in the intensity ratios of the other lights in the system, it, it's, it's gonna be an issue. Um, uh, compatibility with different technologies as well. So if, um, you know, mixing technologies as well. You know, we can't mix halogen and LED in the same system. And then some systems, you could have some, if some systems like runway edge threshold end are considered pretty much the same system. So you can't have some LED and some not, things like that. And what spacings are adopted? So if you have a runway center line light, that's a 15 meter spacing or 30 meter spacing, depending on your supplier, it'll be a different order code. Runway edge lights, depending on your supplier, if it's a 45 meter runway or a 60 meter runway, you could have different ordering codes. Some suppliers will make them that it, it covers all, all uh, they, they, they'll have the coverage for all examples, but some, you, you will select the, the specific one. Um, this just takes me into, um, so ACEMEX, or Advanced Surface Movement Guidance and Control System. ACEMEX is the common uh, acronym. So it's a system that supports surface movement operations in all weather conditions at an aerodrome based on defined operational procedures. Now this, um, there are, I'll show a couple of slides later. There are all, the, the, the new definition for ASMEX is done by services. So these are the latest Euro controls. There was the, um, uh, the edition one came out in 2018 and the edition two came out only in April this year. So I will show the other example where we talk about the level one, two, three, four, five, which is everybody still uses this. Um, so with the services, so we have surveillance. Surveillance service, the position identification and tracking of mobiles. So a mobile is an aircraft moving around. It's a maintenance vehicle moving around. So anything with a transponder that's moving around on that airfield is a mobile. Um, so your airport safety support service, so monitoring and conf conflict alerts. 
you see on the next slides, uh, it, you, you'll see it, uh, I break it up a bit more. Your routing service. So generates ground trajectories for mobiles. And then your guidance service. So automated switching of AGL, FTG, follow the greens, and a AVDGS, um, advanced visual docking guidance systems. So here's just, I just made, just based on, um, I just made this chart up from what, what was in the documentation. So what's actually required based on the, the desired implementation. So if you're implement, implementing surveillance, um, so you'll see the airport safety supports. They have they have the different uh, RMCA, CATC, CMCDA. So you can see I, I've written the, what the acronym mean. Uh, so RMCA, Runway Monitoring and Conflict Alerting. Uh, the routing then, and then here we have our guidance. So our uh, automatic TCL, stop bars, VDGS. So it just shows in X what's required, what's... Uh, what is no, what is this? So you can see uh, automatic TCL is required for surveillance and required for routing. So you can see it there. And this is from the older uh, Euro control document from, I'm not sure when the last one was, but the, the, it, it, was, the, the, it was in the 2000s. And um, so this is where you have your levels. So you'll see people talking about a level one, a level two, a level three, a level four. And level five as well. So level four is the one, the one you'll hear a lot where it's, it's not, it's implemented in a few hub airports at the moment, but this is where everybody is trying to get. So level four will have the, uh, um, so the automatic routing of the aircraft, you, you have the follow the greens, which I show on the next slides where the, the lights are lighting up, but it also has the conflict resolution. So it's a case of if two aircrafts are on this have route, if one aircraft deviates from its set route and they're both, they're both going to hit, the, the, the conflict resolution will, you know, it, it'll turn on a stop bar, it'll stop this guy, it'll send this guy another way. So automatically the algorithm will take care of this so these aircrafts can never hit. So you have that in the level four. The level five is actually, it's the level four, but all of the information, I will show some videos as well. Um, for Matrix sh showing this being implemented and the screen, the, the controller working position, the integrated working position with the ground radars and the airfield lighting. And the pilot would have this as well in his cockpit. That would be the level five. Um, so here, just follow the greens. So follow the greens is automated switching of the taxiway center line fixtures. So it can, it can provide individual guidance information to a pilot which has a cleared route. So it's also known as uh, uh, follow the greens. Um, so the, the taxiway center line lights, they're, they're lit up for a specific distance in front of an aircraft. And then as the aircraft moves, the lights behind will switch off. So uh, I, in the next slides, I'll show you a couple of diagrams. So the, the lights are moving with the aircraft in front of the aircraft. And he's on, on, not, it's not a case of all the lights are on. So the pilot has, it's, it's unambiguous to the pilot. He can only follow that line. He can't, he's not going to get to a complex junction in an airport and all of the taxiway green lights are on. So he doesn't know, he, he, he could get lost, especially in low visibility. Um, so automated switching of the, air, of the AGL is, um, it's achieved by single lamp control. So the lights can be activated or deactivated individually. So either we have ILCMS units, or we have the smart light is built into the lights. We have segment control where a group of lights is activated or deactivated together. So this could be a curve. On, on a curve, you just, you'll just turn on the whole curve. Um, block control, where the majority of taxiway center line lights are permanently lit and specific sections of taxiway center line at junctions are activated or deactivated. So you may have a parallel taxiway where they want to just, they'll just light up the full taxiway and the junctions are switched off. So then when it gets to the junctions that they'll turn on or off. Um, so here, this, all of this, again, this is taken from that Euro control document. Um, it's available, it's free online, you can download it. I think we can, it's free download. I'm sure we can share it with the webinar afterwards. Um, so here, here in the first diagram you'll see, so here's our aircraft. So it's, it's just saying the lights are typically a 15 meter spacing. So you can see the taxiway center line lights. Here we have the reduced spacing. So with taxiway center line lights, 
um, it's re it's recommended before and after the curves we maintain the, the, the spacing of the curves, which is seven point five meters when when we're in uh, low operating in low visibility conditions. So here the lights are lit up three hundred and fifty two meters in front of the aircraft. Why three hundred and fifty two? Because in RVR three hundred and fifty meters, this is where this is where the we're into low visibility and the uh, the taxiway centerline lights are required. So you'll see then the next slide, you'll see that they, they've added another section. So as he's moved, he, so the aircraft has moved, he's moved from uh, just this, the start of this stand here, I think, and he's moved, he's moved onwards. And so this, he's added an extra section here. As he moves on, these lights will turn off. So as he's moving, these lights will turn off and the, these lights will turn on. So the lights will move together in a wave. So I'm conscious of time as well. I'm hitting up to 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, design considerations. So I did give some generic equipment selection. So certain things, if we're going to implement a follow the greens or an ILCMS, uh, what, what we need to be aware of, where we can run into trouble and what we need to consider. So the existing infrastructure and circuitry. So the condition of the infrastructure as well. If the primary circuits are 25 years old and the, the values are so low and you want to try and communicate down them cables, it's, it, it's, it's not going to work for you. So you, you have to see what's there, test what's there, and um, how they've done their circuitry as well. So are, are these circ can, can you just come and add ILCMS to, to the way they've done the circuits? Do we need to alter the circuits? Um, you know, what, what, how are they? How are they achieving the taxiway central line control now? Is it just CCRs on off the circuit comes on? Are they doing it segments with circuit selectors? Um, have they got like field switches, you know, maybe for um, stop bars or something, things like TAN switches to, to control them? Um, are there things like uh, link boxes in the field? So link boxes are, um, uh, say you have, a stop bar circuit that runs a parallel taxiway, you've Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. You may have that interlave circuit goes up Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. But you may have link boxes at the bottom of the parallel taxiway. So if you want to close off Alpha, you're going to resurface it. You're going to widen that taxiway from, you know, maybe it was a wide, maybe it was only 18 meters. You're going to make it a wide body, 23, 25 meters. So even the manholes are gone. If some, some airports have link boxes where you can completely cut off that, so then up above, it's, it's, it's totally, uh, the, circuits, the circuits are no longer part. So then the, the, then the circuit now starts at Bravo, Charlie, Delta. So if something like that, you have to consider it on the ILCMS, because if you do that, that's massively going to change the parameters of your circuits. So the length of your home runs and the, and the resistance of your circuits is going to change them. So you have to be aware that these things are there. Was there ILCMS units there currently? Um, with ILCMS, so which, um, how are you going to do it? Are you going to uh, use, it? are you going to buy lights where it's internal in the lights? Are you going to have external, external line CMS units? Um, are you going to communicate down the power line? Are you going to have a dedicated cable to, to talk to the ILCMS units? So this, this will vary depending on your manufacturer, who you go with. Then it, all of the ILCMS units, then you'll have an, I, an ILCMS master. So this may be a standalone box on top of the CCR, rack mounted in cabinets. This may be just a card inside a CCR. Um, so we'd have to consider then what, what, what load, does this have any load on our circuits as well, this master? And the ILCMS modules, what, what load are they? Are they, four, are they only four watts? Are they five watts? Are they 15 watts? Depending on your manufacturer. And when we're looking at the primary cable, um, uh, characteristics of screened or unscreened, depending on, there's a thing called crosstalk with ILCMS. So if you have some, some uh, manufacturers with ILCMS, they use one frequency and they, they just use time bands. Some, they, they have a wide range of frequencies. And, but if you sometimes, if you have two, to say, if you have two circuits in a big junction crossing, and even though they may be from CCR, different substations, if they're on top of each other, you can get a thing called crosstalk. That's why screen cable is important to, to uh, eliminate this. And also your design of your ILCMS. What frequencies you use, where, 
how the cables are routed. This all needs to be considered. Um, I spoke about this a bit earlier, transformer characteristics. So with ILCMS, they don't, they don't want transformers with high induction. So you'd have to pick a low induction type transformer. Then the rating of your transformer to consider your ILCMS um, module as well. Um, your circuit lengths. Um, so you, when you see a brochure for an ILCMS supplier, you'll see things like, you know, circuits, 15 kilometers, 18, 20 kilometers. We can do units, we have 300 units, 600 units. And they, they give all, all these great uh, marketing parameters. In reality, you can push one, but you can't push them all. So you've got to be aware of how, how um, what are the limitations. So you don't want to be, you don't want to have a very long circuit and then have a, a, like the longest circuit in the world and all the units, you're going to, you're going to run into problems. And um, this, this ca circuit cable routes and interleaving considerations. What I mean by this is um, ILCMS units, they don't like long home run cables and long distances between units. So you have to consider this in your wiring. So if you had, say again, if I take an example of a parallel taxiway, your, your taxiway sent the light, lights across the parallel taxiway. If this was interleaved, so say circuit one goes into light one, goes light two, or sorry, into light one, number one, number three, number five, number seven, all the odds. If you looped in there the whole way, went down and then the very last light, you just, you, you took your home run cable back then you'd have a distance between, say the first, could be a very long uh, substation away. Say like it could be 10 kilometers by the time it got there. And then this taxiway could be two kilometers long. So the distance could be, difference could be 12 kilometers. So a better way to do it would be to bring the two of the cables in. And then you loop the first, the first cable goes into one, then it goes on to five, then it go, and then the second one goes into three, seven, they go on that way and then they just link at the end. Now, ideally, you want to look at the shortest routes, where to put your, your CCRs for your ILCMS so you keep the, the length of the cables down. Um, I talked about this limitation. So your number of, even though a manufacturer will say, I can have 600 addresses, 300 units, you want to, you want to actually talk to them what the recommended number when you're designing the circuits. It's around, you know, it's 120 units, 150 units, something like that uh, per, per circuit. You don't want to push it out too much. Um, with LED fixtures, you'll need a fail open monitoring function. So then you'll have compatibility. Is if you have one someone's light, someone's light, someone's ILCMS, will will they compatible? When it when it says when if, when it uh, the fail open says that uh, this fixture has failed because with a with a halogen lamp, it's a filament. It's, it's gone. The the secondary will open. With, with an LED light, you know, you, you'll, have your, uh, you'll have your LED array, you'll have your LED driver, you'll have your motherboard, you know, your power source. So if, if something fails in, in amongst all that circuitry, you, you, want, you want your ILCMS to know this has failed. So you, you have to make sure they're compatible. Um, with bi-directional fixtures, um, so you got to consider this uh, channel side direction assignment. So what this means is, if you buy a light, it'll say it'll say side A, side B, side one, side two, depending on the supplier. So if if you have maybe you have uh, runway center line lights, you only want to turn on one landing direction, maybe at a time. So you want to either turn on all the channel A's or all the channel B's. So you, you could just got to be aware. So make sure that, that this is this is put into the method statement so the installer knows that all the a's have to go in one direction all the b's have to go in another direction this same with you know gets a bit trickier with uh, uh taxiway center lines you know because you have a lot of curves and things like that so this just has to be laid out in the chart how you do it that, that's easy to follow and uh, the last one i've intensity level for certain speeds and low visibility for bright and daytime conditions so if if you look in the ISO Candela diagram, so I think the first diagram for taxiway centerline lights, it gives the main beam, an like average beam of about 200 candelas for a taxiway centerline light. If you have, um, if, if you're operating uh, ACE megs in the day, in the, in the bright sunshine, this 200 candelas mightn't cut it. So you'll need, you'll need a higher intensity. So there are lights, LED lights out there now that are 400 candelas. There's some out there that are even higher. So this is just what to, you just need to consider this as well. 
if you're going to do your follow the greens, not just in low visibility, visibility, sorry, visibility, but if you're going to do it during the day, during the sunshine, for all of your routing and guidance, you've got to be able to see the lights. And um, just, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm finished with slides now. So I, I've, I've a couple of videos. The first video is two minutes long. This is a, an Ace Megs video from Matrix about level four and follow the greens. And the second video is two minutes 45. So I'll be wrapped up by 45 minutes. Okay. Oh shit. Okay. Um, sorry there when I stopped my my speaker here was buzzing. It was the, so I, I tried to turn down the volume. Um, so this will lead us then into key talked about so airport uh, airport collaborative decision making ACDM. So again, I, I'm certainly not going to do this. Is a whole other webinar series. So it's not just. You know, this, this considers not just the, the ground radar and the multilateral radar and your airfield lighting in your ACE megs, but you're, you're talking about all your, uh, you know, your um, departure managers, your approach managers, your, your, your gate systems, your, um, uh, what are so many of them? Your different radars, your, your different uh, communication systems, surveillance systems. Just bring bring everything in and, and one talking to each other. That's kind of what ACDM means. This is just just the last video. This is this is just a little bit longer. This is about two minutes forty five, and this is just showing the. Um, so now a, a controller working position with the um, with the airfield ground lighting and the uh, the ground radar all on one screen. So we saw what the we saw it from the airfield side. This is what you see from the tower. So again, we just acknowledge we've taken these from uh, Atrix.
Hi, so that's about me. I'll uh, stop sharing, Robert, and give it back to you. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. I think that was excellent, and uh, really appreciate you uh, taking a lot of time and effort to put that together for us. And even more, because I, I definitely heard, uh, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a, an offer to uh, to put together a, a webinar about counterpoise systems there, didn't no. I? Not to. <laughs> And, and ACDM as well, so. No, uh, yeah, not to, not to. <laughs> Keith, uh, Keith, Keith's an expert on both them subjects. <laughs> uh, well, no, thank you very much. Very, very, very good and well put together. Um, uh, and uh, so we've got all our panelists back there. Uh, and so thank you very much, gentlemen. We've got a number of questions coming in. As usual, we're, we're, we're very tight on time. But if I can just cut to the questions then, without any further ado. Um, um, I've got some questions about uh, getting hold of documents. Um, do you have a draft, Keith, of Annex 14 2020? Have you seen that yet? I'm aware of it. I've not yet got a document. Uh, and it's something that, uh, unfortunately, you know, um, I know this came from uh, Mohammed. I saw the question from Mohammed. Um, and uh, uh, no, I don't have a, a, a copy of that draft yet. Uh, and Mohammed also wants to know if the third edition of 9981 has been published yet. The well, I, that's what I, I've tried. I've just heard about it online in the last, uh, you know, couple of hours. So uh, um, I'm advised that it's available, but uh, I've not seen it yet. Yeah, I did. Right. So okay. So if you can, uh, if we, we will, if we'll have a look for that, and if you can find that. something, we'll put a link on. Uh, put a link up. Uh, put some information on the website. Um, Habit also would like to know, Keith, um, if we could place two approach centre line lights with distant 36 metre spacing because of uh, some uh, stuff on the ground. I mean, uh, so what are the what are, what's the flexibility there? Say that again. What is the flexibility for changing the spacing of approach centre line lights if you have some? Um, some some ground so condition in would... the in the direction. Well, actually, it's when you it, it's a, it's a package. When you're looking at approach lights, then uh, if you are looking at approach lights that are as close to the ground as possible, you know, for example, if you've got a displaced threshold, then there would be inset lights. But the lights which are are, are then go out into the nine uh, into into the soft into the area the approach area not associated with pavement then have to be above the ground and so therefore if you if you are going to you do have a tolerance allowance that if you move uh, a, a center line light either forward towards the threshold or backwards toward the threshold then you have to do the trigonometry and change the height slightly so that when the pilot is looking down 
then he sees equal spacing, even though physically they may not be. Okay. So, uh, but equal, equal spacing is the key there. They don't have to be exactly 36 meet, 30 meters apart. Um, my, um, my final question from Mohammed here, uh, but it's a but I'll make it. I'll couch it in more general terms. Obviously, the runway edge, based on the runway edge, normal spacing sixty meters. Um, if that doesn't give you an exact, uh, you know, if, you, if you're trying to get it, uh, if, if it doesn't give you an exact spacing from one threshold to the other, um, how do you choose the uh, point at which you have your first? Uh, edge light from the threshold. What are the rules there? If you uh, if you follow the standard, it said they shall be equally spaced between the threshold and the runway end. And therefore, then uh, in, according to the standard, then you would uh, uh, you would reduce the spacing because the spacing of a runway edge is no greater than sixty meters. That is the formal way to do it. Now, what many airports have done is they look that there is a discrepancy in counting the uh, uh, between the, the length of the runway and the spacing then they lose the difference between the first between the threshold and the first light and the last light and the runway end now if you think about it logically logically then when a pilot is approaching uh, a runway uh, and uh, then they'll be looking at the aiming point. Now the aiming point is going to be so many, you know, 300 meters or so down, down the runway. And, uh, and therefore, if the, between the threshold and the first light is only at uh, say 56 meters rather than 60 meters, uh, then is that going to make a difference on safety? Uh, the answer is no. And if you're coming to the last light and it's only 56 meters rather than the 60 meters, if you have not yet stopped, it's the least of your worries. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Know. you. Um, all right. Um, one for you, Tony, here. Um, if we, uh, Prashant uh, Dubey has asked, if we lost one circuit of a runway center line, then there will be two adjacent failures which is non-compliance as per serviceability requirement, isn't it? Yes, that's true. <laughs> if, uh, uh, so the answer is, do your maintenance well, so you, you minimize that possibility. Um, yeah, if, if you lose one circuit and uh, what the one, the other circuit has got uh, failures in it, then you're, you're not going to be compliant. But then again, of course, there are the requirements for the system to be uh, to have a, 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 a power supply such that, according to the category of operation, I think it's just less than one second for CAT 2 3. Is it 15 seconds for CAT? Yeah. Uh, what, what's the timing? Yeah, so really, well, the, the gold standard, really, what, what I'm aiming at is for crucial parts of the, of, of the lighting, like the runway center line and so on. Well, for low visibility, certainly, you want to no break power supply in there. So it, it's very quick. And that's one of the troubles. It's not some of the old material. It talks about a 15 second switch over um, in the event of your primary power supply failing. It's probably from the domestic supply. And then you start the generator. Um, right from the very beginning of fog flying back in the, the, the 60s, when we were doing a lot of fog flying, uh, to make it safe, we ran the generator with the, with the public uh, supply being the fallback, so there, there, was, there wasn't a 15 second. You can't tolerate that, and there was, there was an incident in this country where someone was committed almost at the threshold, and, and then the lights went out because the, the uh, public system failed because uh, the power station was being attacked by a, stri a strike uh, scenario. Um, you just cannot tolerate um, anything close to the runway, any break in it. 15, a 15 second changeover is more about co continuity of service. It's not safety. 15 second changeover doesn't give you safety. It does give you some continuity, 
to yeah, some yeah, low, yeah. lower level of uh, uh, operating limits. But it, it doesn't, but that was the best technology you could do 50 years ago for the generator in. Yeah. There is a definition, by the way, uh, on, on this in Annex 14 for changeover. What the definition of the changeover is, it's when you lose the power supply and the light falls to below 50% of its design, and it's the time taken for it to return that light, that light back to 50% which is the serviceability level. That's the definition in Annex 14. Yeah. But I, I guess ultimately it also affects the category of operation depending on the level of failure, at which point then that the tower should be directing aircraft accordingly. So yeah. there's a... Now, um, uh, there's a question here, um, again, I think one for you, Tony, to do with uh, dimming curves. It says, is there any technical reason for selection of current as amp 6.6, 5.4 and 4.1 and so on. How did that come into this dimming curve and these, and these amperages? Uh... Well, the, the, the uh, thinking behind that was that uh, one would have discrete steps of brilliancy rather than continuous um, adjustment available to controllers because if you, if you have a continuous and I have a slider, if you like, that one end is 100% and the other end is zero. Um, well, you know, wh where is it actually being set at any one time? Um, it's better to have discrete steps. So that's the first thing. You want discrete steps so you know you're going 130. So, so you're, 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 you're sort of going a sort of 3dB down each time. So they're, they're fixed percentage reductions, as it were. And there is a difference between what is done in many parts of the world and what the FAA do, um, whether it's five or six steps, they were both, uh, in honesty, they were both de developed largely by uh, empirical ex uh, experimentation in the early days, um, the, trying to decide what was the number of steps that gave you sufficiently discrete differences without putting too many in. It. Uh, and of course the implication in cost and switching and so on. So certainly in the UK and most of Europe we went for five steps. The US uh, went for six steps. So there's a, there is a slight difference all the way through. Thank, thank you, Tony. Um, one for you, John, uh, from ne yep. Newa Rehawi, who like who's building a new taxi taxiway, and the contracts have suggested a ten a ten volt ten kVA CCR. He wants to put in a 30 volt K KVA a CCR uh, to, to uh, consider for future expansion. What would you say to that? As, as long as it's, he taps the CCR to the correct setting based on his load, he can do it, yes. If he just puts in the 30 KVA CCR and then if, if it's a 10, if the load was nine or eight or something, and he just put in a 30 and he didn't adjust for it, then it would be massively inefficient. But yes, you, you can, if you want. Right. But even so, <laughs> could I uh, interact in there? But even so, then that's the why uh, we do the calculation of the loadings. Uh, you can do that calculation as John had, has explained in you know, last week and, uh, and we briefly just touched on it this week, is that we do the calculations for the selection of the CCR based upon the kilowatt load. And as John said, yes, you can do that. But if you do what the, the person is suggesting, put a 30 kVA in, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, and then you, if it's a thyristor-based CCR, then you can tap it down. If it's an IGBT, then it, it, adjust, it will adjust itself. For, but the efficiency level will go down. And therefore, the, the, if, you, if you mismatch to, uh, it, it, it by too great an amount, there between the kilowatt load and the KVA size of the CCR, then you may fall below the 90% or the 95%, depending which one it is, uh, the, the efficiency level, which is acceptable. Right. So there um, is, that's why we do the calculations. Um, our friend Steve Hutton is, is watching. Hello, Steve. He would like to, he said, he 
comments, the average intensity ratio uh, uh, note regarding average intensity ratios we were talking about earlier. He said, manufacturers do not design their fittings for this requirement. How do you address this in your design? And he comments in Australia, the Australian defense uh, mix and match their suppliers to achieve compliance with this requirement. So how do you, how do you design for this? Me or Tony? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a good, that's a, that's well, a good Tony question there. <laughs> uh, I mean, basically, basically. Yeah, the, I know because I, I come across this with Australia, an Australian consultant actually asked me this question about ratios. Um, for me, I, I would go, you know, I just go with one supplier. But what he's saying is right. Even with one supplier, they may have, they, they've exceeded it too great and it's gone outside the ratios. So I, I know it is a big thing in Australia, but maybe, uh, maybe Tony has a more <laughs> scientific answer. Well, what I would say is that those, uh, those ratios are there for a very good reason, which I explained uh, in one of the earlier webinars. And uh, I think in one of the questions this week, I, I've given a written reply for uh, those, so that one doesn't get sudden changes in the uh, uh, amount of lighting you can see in low visibility. That, has potential dangers, particularly if, if you go from a state where you see quite a lot of lighting, and then because the lighting isn't uh, uh, matched, uh, you apparently see reductions in the lighting. In the early days of fog flying, that was attributed to the characteristics of the fog. People talked about hook fogs, fogs that got thicker as you, as you got lower to the ground. Uh, uh, in fact, the problem was with the lighting design. Uh, fog doesn't get thicker as you get to the ground, it, it gets thinner almost it, it always. There's, always, there's usually a gradient in it. The thickest of the fog in the mature fog up to a thousand feet. The thickest fog is at the top, the thinnest is at the ground. Um, it doesn't go the other way. The most you can get is a uniform fog, which is very unusual. So um, there were deficiencies there in the early days of the lighting design. Um, the mismatch between the, the, the individual components, the approach and the center line, and where they were pointing. And it was only as we, we investigated more and realized the problem. At about the time we redesigned the, the approach and runway lighting to encompass properly category two and three, we realized that we had to have this basic requirement as you go from one, as you progress down the approach, the amount of lighting you see, once you've acquired it, you must continue to see that or more. And that's where those ratios are a considerable help. You don't want a situation where having made a decision to land on a good segment of lighting, then the segment goes bad on you. And if, if that happens, that's because of your lighting design. And this is, this is a very, thank, thank you, Tony. It's very important to understand that the, uh, the IRVR calculation is based on the assumed intensity of your lighting. And if that lighting is not performing to that level specified in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, IRVR equipment, then your uh, RVR will be overstated. So, uh, so that, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, Sekar has asked. I think it's something you touched on in your presentation, John, in about number of ILCMS re recommended for one circuit and the recommended cable length in one circuit. Is anyone do you have anything to add on that? Is uh, you, I think you talked about 100, 150, was it? Yeah, 120, 150. You don't want to push the the marketing literature of 300 units or 600 addresses. You want uh, the length of the circuit. You know, I think you want to keep your circuits as as short as possible. It would be the easiest. It would be would be the easiest way uh, answer. But it would depend on the airfield. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. not a. Thank you. Um, so um, now we have a question, a question here. Now I wasn't paying attention, but apparently it seems that on one of your taxiway center lines in your, in your presentation, uh, what was the red light, spotted some red lights ex extended of the tech at the end of the taxiway? I, I, yeah, I think it was the FAA, the runway status lights for the FAA, I think. Oh, okay. Or okay. The, there are some, I know there are some development by some suppliers of smart lights, but I think this, this video is back where lights can change color. But um, I think it's the FAA. I think it's the runway status lights. Okay, Mohammed. hopefully that answers your question there. 
And it's, it is um, written in Annex 14 as well. At the very, after all the lighting section, there is a section in there. And Chan, Chandra Mohan says, well done, Mr. John. So uh, I'll pass on all those comments. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, next question. Um, is approach fitting six degree elevation setting mandatory? Um, I would have thought they were talking about six degree approach there. I assume that means. Uh, uh, I, there, there's, can answer. Yeah. <laughs> when you're looking at the approach profile and they look at the vertical settings of the approaches, then depending on how far they are from the threshold, there are there are levels of vertical angles. Those angles are shown in the in the Annex 14 in the notes of the uh, isocandela diagrams. And for approach lights and for the side row barrettes, there is a, 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 a section, you know, a, 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 a comment, a note about those angles, and they are mandatory. Yeah, could Thank I you. just say something there? Those angles are, are pretty critical. Um, and, and in some ways, I think it's one of the biggest things to be looking at in terms of um, serviceability of approach lighting systems are those setting angles, possibly more than, than contamination of the, of the glassware. Uh, although that's a that's a, a bold statement, the setting angles are, are, are pretty crucial. During the development of the of the set of the beam spreads we've got now, with the older set it, fittings which had a narrower vertical beam, I did some fog flying on a culvert system where we left the left hand half of each crossbar at the original setting, and in, increased the setting of the right hand of each crossbar by three degrees and I wish I'd still got the bit of film. Uh, there's a lovely bit of film that showed an approach in the very low visibility condition where the right hand you saw two more crossbars than the left hand side. And there was a, a thousand feet of approach lighting um, improvement simply by getting the setting angles right. So a lot of emphasis in my mind in getting the setting angles correct and stable uh, and in accordance with the Annex 14. Okay, right, well, thank, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. I think that's all we've got time for now. We're, we're running uh, almost 20 minutes past time. So thank you very much for your contributions today. Next week, we're doing, a, we're doing the webinar on the subject of uh, airfield lighting and uh, the uh, and the impact of contamination on the airfield lights and on methods of cleaning those airfield lights to achieve serviceability. I hope you can all uh, join us again next Tuesday, two o'clock UK time, um, and we will send out invites tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, the, uh, to John in particular and to my panel of experts for their very valuable contribution. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.